Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this workshop. It's a pleasure to have uh, all the speakers and everyone around here. Uh, so the first speaker will be Wei Wang. It's my pleasure to introduce him. He is a Provost Vice Chancellor uh, at the, and Professor of Public Health at the Center of uh, Precision Health at Edith Cowan University in Western Australia. And uh, he's also director of a uh, uh, key laboratory and center of excellence in Beijing. And among the many other uh, duty and service he did, I'm also pleased to uh, remind us that he uh, had a membership as an, uh, in the expert panel advising the World Health Organization for the grand challenges in genomics for public health in developing countries. Uh, I think uh, your camera is off. Uh, but uh, please. You can't well, see me? I can't can see you, see you but I can hear you and we can see your slides. So you can, you can see my slides. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, in that case, just go ahead. I think problem with my camera. Uh, how about this time? I just, can you see uh, me now? I cannot, but uh, okay. we, we see your slide and we hear you. So Okay. Wait, go. Yeah. I will go with my slides. Okay. In okay. That case. Okay. Yeah. Uh, please. A very good morning from uh, Southern Globe, Australia. And uh, thank you, Christina, uh, Christine, okay, for your kind invitation. My presentation today is you know, pyrocentral dogma, supporting the central dogma with sugar cause. How can I move to the next one? Oh, okay, good, yeah. So everyone knows the four principal components of a cell, nuclear acid, ACGT, 20 amino essential, uh, essential amino acids, then you got the lipids and the sugars. So the interaction of these uh, four micromolecules contribute to the functions of a cell life. But however, uh, if you see this central dogma, DNA, RNA protein, you now transcription, translation, and the two, uh, the two, four of the you know principal components, two of them are missing. The lipids and the sugars are not covered under this central dogma. So who talks? Who licenses between the sugars and the lipids? So no one knows. Okay. So. Then this is the you know our. Uh, you know this central dogma uh, after you know the double helix we set up this central dogma for, uh, as a, a regulation for our life for our cell and for our biological studies and for genetic and then you know after we we, we you know the discovery of trans uh, re reverse transcription you know uh, then we modified okay uh, from the RNA can tra reverse transcribe to DNA then it is now now okay so you can see the rna interface histone modification dna methylation you just name them a glycosylation and the ubiquinitation all of the okay actually involved in the central dogma work so i name this as a cell social materiality uh, okay sorry materiality so this is just something i want to discuss with you today and this is a recent publication you can see here these long nodding non-counting rays actually from the you know from the the, the fake you know the the, the cartoons at uh, the right side of the slides the first vertical you know, pathways, that's a typical, you know, uh, central dogma from the R, uh, DNA, RA, you know, translation, then from the RA to protein, uh, tra uh, tra uh, transcription, then uh, to the uh, RA to protein translation. Then on the, on the right side, in parallel, this actually is the pathway of this non-counting RA is how they work. It's mean mimic the the pyrocentral dogma part, but play a very different roles. Okay, 
So you can see from here. So these there are functions, uh, you know, discretizations, uh, you know, chromatins, and also all this, you know, involve this, uh, you know, the gathering of of uh, uh, chromatin and uh, and tesserine chromatins, and also involve in this, you know, signaling, and also, you know, if you talk about this, you know, size. Uh, uh, multiverse and, uh, and trans, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 all this part, okay? So, uh, factors, all this involved in this, you know, uh, 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 the RNA modifying process. And if you look at the cytosols, and you can see from here, you know, the rib uh, ribosome, the, the mitochondrial DNA, okay? Even, you know, the, uh, you know, the exosome, and all this involved in. So this uh, 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 alerting us is there a, uh, another pyrocentral dogma existing to support the, the central dogma. And then we talk, uh, after we talk about the RA things, now how about this glycosylation? And I don't mention, mention about the, the glycosylation, you know, how important it is now, you know, just got, you know, Carly from Stanford University uh, got the Nobel Prize. So you can see from here, classically, all these glycosylations are happening in ER and Gorgi operators. And this paper is the first one demonstrated, you know, the small RAs can be modified by, by n glycans and can be uh, glycosylated. And also they can display on the surface of living cell. So this is very interesting. Then my question comes, if this is the case, can DNA be, be glycosylated? So all this part, uh, I just raised these questions in this you know, uh, workshop. <laughs> And from the bottom part, you can see these glycosylations, okay, involving, you know, the, the, the virus replication, duplication. If you see the highlight side, people immediately working on cancers, you know, this, how, you know, these cells, you know, the, the, the you know, the, the internal longevity things, okay? So really interesting, all this part. And for the glycans, uh, also another thing, you know, is the, I ask myself, the HIV and our COVID-19. So why we cannot get a vaccine job done against the HIV? And why we, you know, developed vaccination quickly? Actually, you can see this, which, uh, all the things, actually, the obstacles are these glycans. It's, you know, for the COVID-19, it's like, like to wear a, a T-shirt, okay, uh, or glycans, you know, on, the, on, on his body. But for the, for the you know, the HIV, it's like a, a, a heavy coat, you know, covered by a single layer of glycans. So the people, you know, our immune system just can't identify it just can't get them, uh, get them out rapidly. And I name it, you know, just stay with us, okay? Stay with us. And the other ones, uh, COVID-19, heat and run, okay? Attack you, then go, okay? So these are the fundamental difference. All these, you know, characteristic actually are governed by the glycans. And this is what we are doing. And a majority in this area study on glycans working on, you know, the, 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 the tumor cells. Okay, what, what actually our team is working on the, you know, the, the, the profiling of, you know, human glycans, plasma glycans, IgG glycans. And this is the first glycan profiling, you know, from my team. We link all these glycans like ABO antigen, right blood cell type type antigen. So in such case, for example, here you can see 24 peaks, okay? Then in such case, we can category our human being by this 
glycans, in another word, they can be used as a biomarkers against, you know, all the, you know, the health measures. For example, you know, the height, weight, the DMIs, okay, and the, you know, the blood pressures, systolic, uh, diastolic blood pressures, and, you know, the, the fast uh, uh, plasma uh, uh, glucose. All these actually, uh, 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 you know, uh, the first time we are very happy to have, you know, the health markers to tell people how, how health they are. And this is the, you know, the paper recently, it is online now. And I first time, okay, uh, call this term glycomedicine. And also I propose this pyrocentral dogma. And from here, you can see on the left side is the typical glycans. And the, for example, here, this is the fuel cost. If we remove it, it will enhance ADCC. Okay, it's increase, you know, the antibody dependent cellular cytotoxicity. And in such case, kill the tumor cells, you know, all these things. And on the other hand, if you got the selenic acid here, if you put more on, okay, actually inhibit ADCC. And also CD, CDC, or complement depend, complement depend, depend the cellular toxicity. So all these things are now very important. And in terms of our routine life, aging, exercise, okay, these three, you know, uh, and the genome, these three kingdoms interaction, then we can, we, we propose, we can use this as a biomarkers to actually measure the anti and pro inflammatory so this is why i'm so interested in christine's work okay so if we can apply this basic knowledge uh, into the translation part would be wonderful and here if you know take home message if you say we i still don't know what you are talking about so uh, i got my 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 journey this is uh, you know the talents okay uh, 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 and this is the example she gave us, okay, the genetic code equals letters. For example, eat. Amino acid equals words. So we have different meanings for this, okay? Actually, glycans, okay, is the punctuation, okay? It's like all these grammar things, okay? So if we, we got the wrong place with these glycans, then you got exactly total opposite meaning different meaning and it's a it's a question to you know to happy to eat or to die okay so all these things and here are uh, 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 this the you know i running a special issue for this uh engineering okay uh, this impact factor factor around 12.8 and it's part uh, published by ali saver okay and actually supported uh, by the Chinese Academy of Engineering, uh, the prestigious institution. So uh, this, uh, if someone interested, I'm organizing the second issue now, okay? So you can email me and we can talk this together. And this also after I proposed this uh, pyrocentral dogma, you know, the chief editor from the, you know, the frontiers in immunology contact me. So we can, do you like to run a special issue, you know, in our journals, uh, this is open now, still opening and calling for papers. And also what is the influence, what are our roles for the, you know, the, the big organizations for the government? We actually using our theory propose a uh, suboptimal health ideas. Try to, you know, engage ourselves with all these big organizations. Tell them just don't talk disease every day. We should focus on, you know, health, preventive, predict, predictive, and personalized or precision health. So actually, I'm very, very proud of my team. We were invited by BMZ and the IHI, uh, IHI, sorry, okay? So we organized a, a, a workshop at Sydney 
to tell what exactly what we are doing, how we apply the pro anti inflammatory uh, to to the health care and to to change the you know the current reactive delayed approach to treating non communicable chronic disease. So this is our you know one of our team's research focus. And also under this, you know, the, the suboptimal health based on the, you know, the equilibrium of inflammatories, our team is, is focused on the, you know, the gene environment, nature versus nurture, uh, genomics, epigen uh, genetics, then the glycomics, we also focus on poor reach, you know, in terms of global health perspective. So, uh, like to you know uh, you know really like to integrate uh, our team with with all of you okay uh, in the in the coming days years we can, if we can have a common bilateral interest working on our call interest project and I'd like to thank all these collaborators uh, has been work uh, have been working with me thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this presentation. We have like one minute for questions. I have some things to ask or maybe propose. So basically you are suggesting that the glycan layer is a very important one to add to all the other omics. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. And I'm thinking that's why I just exactly like you mentioned. I want, I, I like to promote it as a a very important role in our life. Actually, for all people working in glycan disciplines, each people talk their individual language. In the discussion, you can see there are so many ideas. There's no existing rule to you know, discuss or you know, to explain what we observed. So that's why and for my talk today, I really want to propose this is the way we need we need a law otherwise we can't integrate ourselves with the basic life law yes this is very interesting and i suspect that there's no information at all about how physical stimuli can change uh, glycomics <laughs> i assume <laughs> so uh, in the future if we work together we can see the environment change yes. for example i'm talking today my now currently the signature of my glycans profiling changes now and it's relatively stable around you know three months okay the half-life of, of glycans okay uh, it's different upon different protein half-life okay so in such case it gave you a signature so it will be a dynamic marker for example you know for the clinicians if we, 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 we treat, you know, the, the immune uh, disease, autoimmune disease, we just based on our experience, clinical experience. There's no objective rules to tell, you know, the drug works, the, the therapy works, or, you know, the, you know uh, we should stop our drug now, okay? Stop this now. So all this, we need a dynamic marker actually tell us what is the effect of these drugs? Okay, so this glycan, I re more and more realize, is a very important marker. So even I, I haven't, you know, expect you know, Carlin can, can got the Nobel Prize is such a early stage. Okay, <laughs> I tell the truth. Yes, yes, I understand. Thank you very much for uh, this presentation and for showing the importance of this neglected uh, layer for now. And uh, so now I will uh, give the uh, talk to another speaker. So Carla Ferreri, she will talk of another layer, of yet another layer. So uh, she is an expert in lipids. She is a uh, uh, colleague at CNR. Yes. Although she's in a different institute, and she's no, also no, the scientific yeah. director of uh, Nutri Lipid Genomics, which is a leader in uh, nutrition and li lipids so she will tell us more about this with her talk welcome carla 
Thank you very much, Cristina. I'd like to share my screen, okay, with the, all of you. You can see it, I hope. Do you see? No, we can't. Can you upload? Can you do present and the slides? I, I, did, I did it. Do you see it? No. No, no, we don't see it. No. Can you go to Sorry, present? Screen, present. Slides. Slides. Then you go at the bottom at file from your computer. Your computer, yes. Upload and, file. OK. And here is the. You should see it soon. Yeah. Oh, well, recent, let me see, because I, okay, this one, okay, okay, it's going, <laughs> okay, uh, yes, I am in the National Council of Research in uh, Bologna, and I am uh, leading both a research group in uh, that is focused on cell membrane lipidomics, and I am scientific director of Lipinutragen, uh, which is a spin-off uh, company born from my research uh, on membrane lipidomics. What I propose to this uh, consortium, I thank uh, Christine to have invited me in this consortium, is uh, uh, the molecular vision of health that also the previous speakers uh, spoke about. Uh, and uh, we, um, per, we are very convinced, all of us, I think, that health is within the cell. And the health means molecular health. Uh, in um, considering our topic, our topic is membrane. And it is trivial to say that no cell can exist without cell membrane. But, uh, of course, uh, this leads us to focus on the bricks of the cell membrane, which are phospholipids, and, uh, they, uh, and their spontaneous assembly, which is uh, um, driven by the nature of the hydrophobic tails. The hydrophobic tails uh, can be saturated fatty acid, monounsaturated fatty acid, and polyunsaturated fatty acid that, that you can see here a sketch, a molecular model of these fatty acids. And they, as you can see, in the unsaturated part of fatty acid, they display a cis geometry. In fact, if you focus on the trans geometry, you will see that the features of the bending of the molecular structure is completely lost. Actually, in the beginning of 2000, in 2006, we were intrigued by the fact that the eukaryotic cells exclude the trans geometry from their choice. And there are enzymes that are called desaturase enzymes, which provide the stereo and regiochemistry of this double bond. The stereochemistry is always cis. Why? You can see in the left that the assembly of the phospholipid, due to the hydrophobic tails, have two uh, different uh, assets, the gel and fluid states. And uh, to make it simple, the gel is, cons uh, con is consistent with the hydrophobic tail being saturated fatty acids, which imparts rigidity to the uh, assembly, whereas the monounsaturated cis and polyunsaturated cis uh, fatty acid chain gives a, a more fluid uh, structure. Also, cholesterol come into play, but this is too long to explain how cholesterol comes in, the, uh, in regulating membrane fluidity and properties. I like to make two focuses. First of all, membranes as compartments are not spectators. Every one of us knows that there are active and passive transportation in the membrane, uh, receptor allocation, regulation of interaction. So, uh, the membranes uh, um, hold all receptors in their uh, position. The membrane organize uh, uh, phospholipids uh, such as phosphoserin, for example. There are uh, important assays on the flip flop of phosphoserin. And also the blabbing of the membrane, so the change of the morphology of the membrane can uh, inform of apoptotic signaling. 
and also all the processes of vesicle formation and, and in the synapses and in exosomes, membrane fusion processes are uh, depending on the fact that membranes as compartment, they are not spectators. And if you want to deep to go deeper in these uh, uh, subjects uh, that I cannot, of course, speak uh, about them, uh, there are two important reviews in chemical reviews and in uh, BMC biology that uh, speaks about the membrane as compartment, uh, as organization, domains, uh, partitioning of proteins, uh, everything you, can, you need to know about this. I like also to say that membranes have, are not spectators, also as a signaling and reacting dock. But unfortunately, in these pictures, I select these two pictures about uh, how is uh, working in hormone drugs and molecules that uh, uh, interact with the receptor, or how is uh, going the cascade from the infection stimuli. Unfortunately, in all these pictures, as you can see, membranes are reproduced as a line that is without any role. And I like to point your attention to this, which is, in my opinion, an under-evaluation of the role of the membrane. And I want to uh, really take five minutes of your attention speaking about uh, what happens to membrane uh, under stimuli. Uh, in, in particular, I chose the um, UV radiation because, okay, we were in the summer time, but we are always exposed to, to UV radiation that you can uh, individuate as, as one of the possible stimuli to the membrane. And uh, besides speaking about altered fluidity, I will uh, point your attention to chemical reaction and biochemical reaction that occur under UV radiation. And I take the example that Anna Nicolaou made in her very nice review on chemicals and physics of lipids. Uh, after when you get a sun and you have a sunburn, you uh, create ROS, reactive oxygen species, but you also activate a phospholipase enzymes that you can see on the right. It is uh, a, a selective br breakage of uh, the uh, C2 position in the uh, glycerol moiety, and the fatty acid in position 2 is released. And you can see in this uh, picture that uh, there are several fatty acids released by phospholipase A2, but the, the two more meaningful uh, are uh, um, polyunsaturated fatty acid, omega-6 polyunsaturated fatty acid arachidonic acid, and omega-3 uh, eicosapentaenoic acid. They, going into the uh, cell, they are taken by COX-2, and they produce two kinds of uh, prostaglandin series, E2 and E3. And they have a balanced uh, effect because uh, the series 2 is uh, uh, activating inflammatory uh, acti um, reaction, and uh, series 3 is uh, uh, activating uh, the uh, anti-inflammatory uh, reaction under this uh, kind of signaling. So combination with the PPAR receptors and, and also NFKB signaling activated by ROS is uh, coadjuvating this uh, information and goes to the nuclei, uh, to the nucleus, and you have more uh, synthesis of COX-2 and cytokines when series 2 is active and less inhibition, let's say, of this pathway when series 3 is active. I like to say that uh, when you release some fatty acid from membrane by phospholipase A2, or when you peroxidize lipids on, in the membrane, on the other hand, you activate a, a re positioning of phospholipid in the membrane that is called land cycle. Land cycle is known since, it, since the mid of, nine, of 20th century, 1957. And what is uh, the meaning of this uh, activation of land cycles? Membrane remodeling. Membrane remodeling 
is the uh, is the process that is activating every time any radiation any stimuli is happening to the membrane and uh, it is uh, also very important for our approach that is a personalized approach because depending on the lipid pool on the fatty acid pool that is present in our body so depending on the metabolic and nutritional condition of the subjects this remodeling is giving the possibility of going into the balance in fact if arachidonic and epa are balanced in the membrane of the person the sunburn is under control. But if arachidonic acid is more concentrated in the body of that person, the sunburn is giving problem because it is not stopped. It is not repaired by the series three prostaglandin. Here you can see the scenario of inflammation in a very beautiful, um, in a very beautiful scheme uh, proposed by Charles Seren in Nature, and you can see that uh, there is an interplay between uh, the series two and uh, leukotriene in series, series four and uh, the series three or more uh, more modernly we speak about specialized pro resolving mediators from the omega-3 series in the first moment you have initiation of inflammation because the rapidity of the formation of the series 2 prostaglandin is very very good but in the meantime, the built up of specialized pro resolving mediator and CDS3 prostaglandin is giving the so called lipid mediator class switching, which is giving the uh, resolution and more importantly, the homeostasis of the tissue. Therefore, I like really to uh, take your attention when you uh, built up something about physical biomedicine to consider membrane as a very active site, characterize membrane lipidome composition, uh, and individuate the optimal condition representing the homeostatic condition. This is very important. All the experiment that is done in all parts of the world is in presence of a restricted diet because the cells do not have possibility to build up their membrane composition like in the body of a person. This is uh, valid for uh, all the 3D model uh, from the cell culture until the organoids. This is a really a, a mistake that we are doing. And then after giving this possibility of the homeostatic condition, we have to characterize both physical properties and remodeling and molecular features. And then we have to evaluate the effects of environmental and cellular condition for the membrane lipidome changes in order to create the membrane which responds in a balanced way to the stimuli. Otherwise, we will have always an excess on one side or the other side about the response. And these are all factors that are, um, they participate to keep or repristinate membrane balance toward the correct inflammatory and anti-inflammatory balance because we must say that also inflammation is very important to protect our body. Uh, so uh, I, I say the last slide is about one of, uh, a, 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 we, we, we tried at least to combine these two uh, vision in uh, uh, watching the membrane, erythrocyte, the erythrocyte membrane of obese patient. And here you can see two physical measures, the atomic force microscopy between control and obese, and, and the fluorescence anisotropy between control and obese. And you can see that obese decrease both physical parameters, and this corresponds to lipidome analysis, which, uh, uh, which detect a decrease of sphingomyelin, 
an increase of uh, uh, the ratio between cholesterol and phospholipid and also a more inflammatory membrane asset with increase of arachidonic acid and omega-6 and uh, an increase of omega-6, omega-3 ratio and an increase of the saturated, monounsaturated ratio, which is also um, meaning rigidity of the membrane. So I think that I gave at least for the time that was uh, uh, for me an, an uh, overview of our approach and we are ready really to collaborate to, to all of you in order to give uh, a very wide scenario. I am in favor of the contamination about all kinds of discipline and all kinds of approach and only from discussion from of all scientists, we can do the best experiment possible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carla. It was really interesting. Thank you for collecting so many information in such a short time. And uh, yes, of course, inflammation and lipids uh, are a story. <laughs> we will see later also uh, in the next, in a future presentation the importance of uh, uh, ultra. Um, sunlight and the effect on cells from another perspective so this is also very interesting i'm we, very happy yes. so i chose the good example thank yeah. you very much we also tried together to have an attempt and parallelize the omics we wanted to explore with you also this uh, we will see if this is feasible from the same samples or if we need to duplicate Absolutely. this is also another area of uh, interesting exploration so uh, thank you. We have uh, thank you. one minute for more questions if someone uh, wants to write them uh, in the chat. Otherwise, we can keep them for later when we uh, will discuss after all the presentations. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Carla. So it's now time to introduce Simona Villata. She's a PhD student at the Politecnico of uh, Turin. Uh, she. Good morning. In particular, she works at the Department of Applied Science and Technology and the Polito Biomed Lab, where, she, where they construct uh, very fancy 3D um, <laughs> bioconstructs that she will tell us something about now. Please. Yes. Thank you for the kind introduction and for the invitation, the opportunity. And good morning, everyone. I would like to show you this investigation we are making on a 3D in vitro skin model that we electrostimulate to activate and enhance wound healing. So first, uh, let me just spend a few words about the background, uh, about skin. Skin uh, is the most extended organ we have, and it is a layered organ. So we have three main layers. The epidermis on the surface, in which uh, the most abundant cell types are keratinocytes and melanocytes. Then going deeper, we have dermis, that is this collagen-based matrix in which can, we can find mostly fibroblasts. And then the deepest part is hypodermis, in which we can find again fibroblasts, but also adipocytes, uh, lipocytes, and macrophages. So since uh, skin is the most external facing organ we have, it is uh, in contact, in constant contact with uh, the external environment. And for this reason, it's the first line of defense uh, against uh, injuries of wounded or external pathogens like uh, viruses, bacteria, fungi, and so on. And so it is the main site often for therapeutic stimulations and in particular therapeutic physical stimulation to induce healing. So what happens when we get injured, when we get a wound? Uh, our body recruits uh, many um, mechanisms, many processes that act to have wound healing, so to repair uh, the, the injury. And wound dealing is the physiological function that is granting the return to homeostasis after an injury in all living beings. It has many uh, processes into, into it. And one of the, the main processes we have is inflammation. Inflammation begins right after the injury, and it begins uh, with the, the leak of transudate from the injured blood vessels. These transudates are made by water, salt, proteins. It has, they have many components. 
And uh, inflammation can be painful because um, it causes a swelling, rash and eating in the, the area, but it's still very important because it controls bleeding and prevents infection. So it is a very crucial passage in wound healing. Another thing that we can witness during uh, when we get injured is uh, are the endogenous electric fields. So since keratinocytes in the epidermis have many uh, electrical properties, if we interrupt the epidermis, we can measure at the ed edges of the wound an electric field, and it has been estimated of about 100 millivolt per millimeter in direct current. And this, uh, uh, with the inflammation, so endogenous electric fields and inflammation are the two main columns uh, from the biological point of view on which we build the project. But there is also a practical aspect that is that uh, electrical stimulations have been used and is used nowadays with different modalities and with different purposes, both on animals and on humans. Okay, so what is the aim of the investigation of the study? Uh, since uh, there exists a promising physical simulation for therapeutic application, but uh, there is a problem cons concerning the, um, the standardization of uh, the design of preclinical -clin pre experiments, we wanted to, to solve the situation or to try to, to give uh, a possibility. And so we uh, focused on both the selection of a proper in vitro biological model, so uh, to solve the, the biological part, and then to select a set of physical param parameters to, uh, to stimulate them. Okay, so first things first, uh, the model, the skin model. Uh, we developed a, a simple skin model because we wanted it to, to be reproductive reproducible in all the cellular laboratories. So we have dermis and epidermis, as we, you can see in the picture. And dermis is just a collagen-based uh, matrix. And why collagen? Because uh, as we said, it is the most abundant component of skin extracellular matrix, in particular in dermis. And into collagen, we laid in fibro human fibroblasts. Then on top of the dermis, the dermis part, we see the, the human keratinocytes that thanks to a very rich medium um, reaches the condition of a, a mature epidermis. The, the model was cultured on these uh, inserts that you can see in the pictures that are very useful to do what is called the air liquid interface culture. So we have the medium underneath the model, so it can have nutrients and it can disperse wastes, but then we have the, the epidermis is in contact with air, so as uh, it happens in, in, body, in our body. Uh, after 14 days of culture, of this type of culture, we uh, inflammate the models. So we add to the culture medium TNF-alpha, that is a inflammatory cytokine. And after 24 hours of inflammation to resume the wound healing condition, we uh, applied the stimulation. So with two needles, uh, two sterile needles at a distance of one centimeter, one to the other. Okay, so uh, here some microscopy images. We stained the nuclei of the cells inside our 3D model. And on the left part, you can see um, the nuclei of keratinocytes and you recognize them thanks to um, they are very small and rounded, while on the right side, you can see the fibroblast nuclei that are more elongated and embedded in collagen. And this was the model after 14 days, so at the, the, the start of the experiment. Okay, so this was the biological part, the model, the skin model, the platform. But then we wanted to set, as I said, the, the parameters. And we wanted to start from what has been witnessed in, uh, in nature, so the endogenous electric field. And since they have been estimated of about 100 millivolt per millimeter in direct current, and since we have a distance between the needles that is uh, one centimeter, so 10 millimeters, during the calculation, we understood that to mimic uh, the 
physiological in vivo situation after a wound, we um, had to apply the tension of, a of one volt in direct current. So this is the mother of our conditions, the, the, the first one we set. Then we wanted to try others. So from one side, we enhanced the tension to enhance the stimulation. So we tested also three volts in direct current and five volts in direct current. And then since electro electrical stimulation in general, electroacupuncture are um, usually performed in alternate current to reduce the heating of the treated area, we wanted also to treat uh, um, with the alternate current. So we took uh, the highest tension, 5 volt, and we tested it with a low frequency, 10 hertz, and a high frequency, 100 hertz. And this uh, is uh, the, the set of parameters we, we tried, we tested onto our samples. And the, here the setup. So for the DC stimulations, we had uh, this DC power supply that is a common one uh, for, I think, all the electrical, electronical laboratories. And we used the alligator clips to both uh, take the needles and also to um, connect it with them with the power supply. Uh, we used the sterile needles to treat the samples. And then we have, as you can see in the small picture, this uh, 3D printed uh, home designed uh, needle support. It is very important both to have also um, always the, the same distance between the needles, so one centimeter, and to um, and these uh, holes you can see into the structures are very useful to let the sterile flow of the biological hood to flow so we can um, simulating sterile conditions. More or less the same setup for the alternate current uh, simulation. So again, we have the alligator clips, uh, the needles, and the needle support. But uh, the power supply um, is, is uh, an electronic acupuncture treatment instrument. So it is uh, the instrument that the electroacupuncturists used on their patients, and in which we could um, uh, choose uh, tension and frequencies with different knobs, so separately, and this was very useful to set the conditions. Okay, here I have a small video of uh, the, the stimulation. So we insert the well for cell culture with the insert with the skin model inside under the needle support. Then we insert the, the first needle into the, the sample sorry for my head, and when the first needle is inside the sample, the circuit is still open, so no current is flowing, but then we insert the second needle, and when it touches the skin model, the circuit closes, and so we have current that is flowing into the sample, and we are stimulating. Then, after the simulation, we remove the, the, the needles, and the sample is ready for uh, further investigations. It has been stimulated. So thank you. Okay, and uh, finally, I would like to do some conclusions and uh, propose some future perspective because we have acted from the biological point of view. So we are obtaining a real in vitro model for wound healing. It is a simple one. It is very reproducible, but it resumes very well what is skin in nature. And uh, our hope in our laboratory and in our projects is to have in vitro models that one day um, will be uh, able to substitute animals uh, in, uh, in clinical trials, both for ethical and uh, technical um, reasons, of course. So this was the, the biological part. But then also we, we are describing a set of electrical parameters that are promising to us wound dealing after injuries, but because they are based on nature, on what has been witnessed, witnessed in, in nature. And this is very important because our body knows how to, to repair, so it, it is important to, to learn also from it. And um, to, to get together these two aspects, uh, it is important to highlight that uh, our models, these in vitro models, are able to bear all the stimulation we set. So it, it, 
mm, it is alive after the, the stimulations and it is not damaged. So it is a good platform to study this type of stimulation. So now the next step will be um, to understand which is the exact response in terms of DNA, RNA, proteins and so on, uh, that the simulation, every stimulation, each stimulation is able to induce in our samples in order to uh, understand better their anti-inflammatory effect and maybe to choose one of them as the best one. And uh, at the end, I would like to thank, uh, of course, Christine Nardini for the, the invitation and the collaboration. And I would like to thank all of my research group, my dear colleagues and my supervisors. And thank you for your attention. If you have any questions or comments, I would be happy. Thank you, Simona. You have indeed you. a couple of questions. So uh, Carla Ferreri, who presented just before, asked, can we examine the cell membrane of these cells? So. We, we already interacted with Carla for this, but you can go on or I can add something. Okay. The cell membrane, I think um, it depends on what you want to examine because we have, for example, some, some staining for the cellular membranes and this can be done. Or I don't know in, in which terms you are um, you're asking. Uh, so, Carla, uh, we, we asked Carla whether it was possible to do lipidomics on these samples. Yeah. And uh, one, uh, I add Carla as well. So, one issue was that, I mean, it is possible to do lipidomics on these samples, but not on the same samples from which we already extract DNA and RNA for uh, omics. So, but maybe you have more technical questions, Carla, or I don't know if this is sufficient. Then, Okay, okay, but uh, we need the test tube with the cells. <laughs> so yes. one of the cells that got this uh, impulse, uh, you take it out, uh, wash it and give to us. Right. And the, we will do the lipidomic of the cell membrane. Right. Well, our hope was that we could ex use the <laughs> inside of the both, cell to do the both. omics and <laughs> give you the outside, but this is not possible. So we need to duplicate yes. the, the experiment. So yes. there's more questions. Um, Laura Calta uh, asks, uh, she says an unpleasant but obvious question, how do you handle the vasculature point of the 3D model? Without vascularization, it is difficult to say that, you, uh, is it difficult to say that your model is adequate to study skin repair in vitro? Yes, this is a very good question because it is like the central point of uh, the ones are studying uh, in vitro models that are trying to develop uh, in vitro models that are more and more similar to the, the human conditions. Of course, vasculature is one of the main and the central points. And uh, uh, they are develop mm, developing uh, many techniques uh, to try to resample them. We don't have vasculature. We have the, um, uh, the membrane that of the insert that tried to, to, to replicate, to replace the vasculature, but of course it is um, um, just a reproduction. We, we miss uh, all the, um, the endothelium, for example, or the, the, the anti, I don't know how to say. Um, yes, it is uh, of course uh, a model and not so complete, but it is a good uh, reproduction for what was our purpose. But it is a very good question because vasculature is a crucial point in, in vitro models. So thank you. Maybe we can add that this is a first step. So for example, yes. there's a lot of experiments simply on cells for drugs and for physical stimuli, it's really a, an issue not to consider the 3D component. So this is a sort of upgrade to start and see the effect of stimuli on cells while keeping at least the 3D dimension. Uh, I can see is, another yeah. question. Yeah. Yes, is there, this is from Jean-François Moreau, is there any dual effect uh, that is, is the temperature between, uh, does the temperature between electrode increases? Okay, here another very good question because we tested many uh, simulations and if you in particular in direct current 
if you get too high with the tension, collagen begins to burn. So yes, there is a jowl effect and we try to be very conservative, so to stimulate, but not damaging the cells and the sample itself. So yes, of course, absolutely. Uh, one last question from Vitaly Zablotsky. What was the frequency of the electric current? Okay, uh, we tested both DC direct current and then we, when we tried alternate current, we wanted to test low frequency, so we uh, simulated 10 Hertz and high frequency, so 100 Hertz, these two ones we, we selected. Do you have more questions? Any more questions from the audience or? Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Simona. So I will introduce the next speaker, Tiziana Guarnieri from the University of Bologna. She is an expert uh, of the real hydrocarbon uh, There's echo. Anyway, I'll leave you the floor and so tell us about the role of this receptor and its interaction with light. Please, okay. Tiziana. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Christina, uh, for inviting me to this meeting. And uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm here uh, to talk uh, about uh, um, full biological systems where both the recognition system, as uh, you can see in the bottom part of the slide, uh, both the transducer are biological entities uh, which detect optical stimuli and produce a qualitative response, a qualitative response via chemical or physical transduction, so differently from uh, man-made optical sensors uh, which you can uh, you can see uh, in uh, the um, upper part of the slide, or uh, simple uh, optical biosensors which have a, uh, only a part the uh, recognition element which is biological. Uh, we are uh, talking about whole cell biosensors, and uh, uh, so um, more in general. Uh, uh, we would like to, to talk about living cells are a set of uh, uh, sensor arrays uh, which are able to detect and to transduce uh, specific stimuli uh, through um, specific pathways. And uh, in, uh, in uh, our case, um, we, we can, uh, we can uh, uh, talk about uh, the stimulus, uh, which is uh, the uh, solar radiation, uh, which is the solar radiation um, that, uh, oh, I'm sorry, this is the uh, old, this is the old presentation and I uh, would uh, kindly ask to, to choose uh, um, to remove uh, this presentation from the streaming and uh, to add uh, the, um, the newer one. Can, uh, can I, I uh, do it, uh, Christine? Uh, you can, but you should upload your presentation. Okay. Uh, okay, I'll, uh, now I remove it and I can choose this okay and we can start we can start okay okay uh, do you do you do you see the presentation uh, okay thank you thank you and sorry no the presentation is the the same and so we can we can uh, go on with this presentation and uh, and uh, uh, we can uh, we can see that uh, the optical uh, um, uh, stimulus is composed from uh, uv radiations visible radiations and uh, infrared uh, radiations and uh, uh, which have a, a different wavelength and uh, a different energy 
and uh, um, we have to consider that uh, um, um, uh, depending on the wavelength uh, um, uh, uh, of the radiations, uh, in particular for UV radiations, uh, the longer is the wavelength, uh, the deeper is uh, the um, distance which is covered from this radiation and uh, um, the deeper is uh, the stratum, the layer of uh, our skin, which is rigid. And uh, uh, so we can consider uh, UVC radiations, which are uh, the higher in, uh, in energy and uh, that uh, are halted by ozonosphere uh, and uh, UVB radiation, which uh, reach uh, uh, the uh, our epidermis and uh, uh, that uh, um, are only the five percent of UV radiations uh, that um, reach the art and uh, UVA uh, which have the the longer wavelength and reach the uh, dermis uh, and uh, are the ninety five percent of uh, UV uh, radiations. And uh, uh, we, we can, can also see uh, that uh, uh, in, uh, our, in our body, not, uh, not only in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, the skin, uh, there are a lot of molecules which are uh, able to sense uh, these radiations. And uh, uh, in addition to uh, opsins, which are uh, five, uh, five types uh, of, uh, um, of which isoforms of, of molecules, uh, we can see uh, that we have also uh, aminic group, and so hemoglobin, uh, various cofactors, uh, vitamins and uh, pigments, uh, among them uh, lipofusin and uh, the well-known melanin and other molecules which are able to absorb uh, these radiations are nucleic acids, uh, proteins, lipids, carbohydrates and, uh, and water. And uh, um, uh, it is important to say that the photobiological outcome of uh, the, um, these, these molecules when excited from uh, solar radiation uh, depends on their absorption spectrum. And uh, it is important also to say uh, that, uh, I'm sorry, that, uh, um, uh, it, it, is, uh, it is important to say that uh, the absorption of this radiation uh, can be done by chromophores and by photosensitizers. And uh, uh, in particular, uh, chromophores uh, are uh, molecules uh, like uh, uh, those which are present in our photoreceptors, cones, and, and roads. And an example, a well known example, is 11 uh, cis retinol, which is bound to a, a, um, an opsin. And uh, uh, this uh, compound, when excited from uh, a photon of light, uh, is isomerized, passing to cis from trans retinal and causing a conformational change which activates vision, the phototransduction cascade. And in, in this case, the uh, chromophore or the, the uh, two chromophores uh, uh, are able uh, to absorb, uh, to reflect, absorb energy and to reflect a certain color. Well, um, we, uh, we are interested also in photosensitizers that are molecules that able to absorb energy and to transfer this energy to another molecule which is not able to absorb directly this energy. And uh, this is the case of uh, uh, tryptophan, which is an essential amino acid and uh, uh, it can be photosensitized 
uh, when exposed to visible light. And this is um, a really, really interesting molecule uh, because it uh, can give rise to a, um, a group of molecules uh, um, which derive from photooxidation. And uh, um, concerning skin, in uh, last 20 years, uh, um, a molecule which uh, uh, is 6-4-mile indole 3 2 bicarbazol and its acronym is FICZ. Um, it, uh, it is uh, become more and more famous uh, because it is a good photosensitizer. As you can see, uh, it has an absorbance maximum at 309 uh, nanometer and it is largely formed in our skin, but not only in our skin. Um, it is a molecule that uh, 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 has attracted my attention uh, because it binds uh, um, another really interesting molecule, a transcription factor, which uh, name is aryl hydrocarbon receptor, uh, which is famous, uh, mostly famous, because it is a sensor for xenobiotics. Uh, this is the more famous function of this transcription factor. But uh, we have to consider that it is an ancient um, evolutionary conserved molecule uh, whose function were originally uh, bound to the control of uh, uh, cell cycle differentiation, proliferation, and um, it uh, ad added uh, the um, uh, xenosensor um, uh, functions um, when uh, our atmospheres and uh, when all um, biotic and non-biotic matrices enrich were enriched from uh, photocombustion uh, products um, uh, during evolution. And so uh, it, it has a leading role in detoxification processes, in uh, uh, the control of immune function, and uh, this is the really interesting function uh, in inflammation. Um, so uh, if we, we see uh, this uh, um, resuming slide, uh, when exposed to uh, a UV radiation, our skin um, uh, is, uh, is uh, uh, the theater of uh, a series of uh, um, reactions which are uh, uh, fundamentally linked to immunosuppression, DNA damage, and uh, to uh, inflammatory reactions. Um, um, in a, uh, and also in uh, uh, the generation of reactive oxygen species. In uh, this uh, um, uh, framework, uh, AHR uh, is, uh, um, uh, has a leading role uh, which, is, uh, uh, which has been discussed in, in recent years and uh, which is uh, bound which is bound uh, to inflammation and to the control of uh, immune uh, response. And, sorry, and um, we, we, can, we can focus our attention uh, to uh, what happens in, in our skin when uh, it is exposed to solar radiation and uh, um, uh, the, the center of our attention is uh, uh, the uh, FICZ molecule, which is the photooxidation product of tryptophan, uh, which you, you can see uh, can, uh, can be uh, in addition to uh, the presence of UVA radiation, uh, it, it can evoke uh, photosensitization, uh, evoking oxidative stress, and, and so cell death. Uh, in parallel, uh, when FICZ interacts with AHR and uh, activate uh, it, uh, it, um, it is able to uh, induce uh, 
uh, uh, uh, cytochrome uh, cytochromes and so the detoxification process and uh, to induce uh, the activation of EGFR signaling, inflammation and uh, uh, a general stress, UV stress response. The interest in this, uh, of this framework is that FICZ is the best endogen agonist of uh, uh, aryl hydrocarbon receptor and that aryl hydrocarbon receptor uh, can be a double-edged sword as uh, in uh, um, context uh, um, and those it has a context and those dependent uh, effects for example when it binds FICZ as you can see in, in uh, this slide it can evoke both uh, inflammatory pro-inflammatory and both anti-inflammatory response and uh, the um, situation uh, as, as you can see in, uh, in this slide is uh, uh, that uh, um, uh, is, is also enriched by uh, the fact that uh, AHR uh, considering uh, our skin uh, is also able uh, to uh, induce uh, the acceleration of the epidermal terminal differentiation when uh, FICZ is induced by uh, UVB exposition and uh, in uh, addition to uh, the um, uh, and with the participation of uh, this uh, OVOL1. And uh, so uh, the situation is, is not so clear because uh, um, uh, AHR has a highly promiscuous binding pocket and it can um, interact with a plethora of ligands, both of endogenous and exogenous uh, type, uh, both uh, coming from our metabolism, both uh, from microbiota metabolism, both from anthropic origin, if exogenous, and uh, natural origin. And so, as you can see in the bottom part of this slide, uh, in considering uh, the context and uh, uh, above all considering the ligand which uh, uh, is able to, to bind to HR uh, this uh, transcription factor can uh, exert an anti-inflammatory uh, action and uh, or a pro-inflammatory action and uh, this is uh, the uh, double-edged sword uh, which I evoked uh, which I just evoked and uh, in particular, considering our skin, as we, we saw in a previous slide, AHR, when uh, is uh, uh, exposed, uh, when, uh, sorry, um, our skin, when is exposed to uh, UVB, to solar radiation and UVB, with the participation not only from FICZ, but also uh, other pollutants which are exogenous ligands of, of this transcription factor uh, so with a combined action can be uh, really a um, promoter of uh, uh, inflammatory processes and so um, there is uh, uh, the need to consider this double nature of AHR and the possibility um, uh, to modulate and to regulate its action uh, in order to dampen its uh, pro-inflammatory action or in order to uh, modulate and to evoke its inflammatory action uh, when uh, it, uh, the, this action uh, is, is needed. And um, I, I think uh, that uh, this, uh, this is all and uh, thank, uh, thank you for, uh, for your kind attention and um, I'm here for, uh, uh, to answer you if necessary. Okay. Thank you, Tiziana. Thank you. Uh, are there questions from the audience? We have some time. So maybe I would like to add something. Uh, we are trying to reconstruct. I have too much to put. 
So maybe we'll discuss later. Okay. I, I if if uh, no questions. Please. Okay. Um, I I uh, would like, if I can, uh, um, to to answer to um, previous uh, previous uh, question uh, of uh, um, Laura Calza about uh, the possible. Um, the, the participation of the vasculature of uh, the uh, three-dimensional system. And uh, it, I think uh, it, it could be possible to mimic uh, this, uh, this participation um, considering uh, uh, some models uh, uh, which uh, are uh, um, uh, uh, the, the expertise of some groups uh, uh, that um, work with uh, a system composed uh, uh, composed of different chambers with pumps uh, which uh, um, uh, are able to uh, surf made uh, um, uh, culture um, uh, um, this this system are able to uh, circulate the uh, liquid the tissue culture and so to mimic uh, in, in a, an artificial way uh, the circulation to uh, to uh, uh, even, even if it's it's a, a not, it's it's a model uh, i think it it could be possible and uh, um uh, so, so um, I think uh, th there is the this possibility. Okay. Uh, Lara Calza says I agree, but yeah. she's the next uh, speaker. A question from Jean Francois Marot. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, in Dolamin, uh, uh, yes, uh, I. Uh, I, I did, did not say that uh, uh, also. Also, uh, indolamine 23 dioxygenase uh, is uh, an important enzyme in this in this framework, uh, as uh, it, it is uh, it is able uh, to uh, produce kynurenine. And uh, um, last slide was uh, uh, about uh, this problem, uh, as uh, um, kynurenine can be formed in. Uh, uh, tissues that are not skin in particular i studied uh, this uh, enzyme in uh, in breast in in uh, mammary tissue and uh, in uh, in breast cancer uh, indolamine 2 3 dioxygenase is uh, induced by the inflammatory framework it produces kynurenine that binds to aryl hydrocarbon receptor uh, that uh, uh, is is uh, activate and uh, it's, uh, uh, it is able to sustain an IL-6, interleukin-6, um, uh, auto, auto inflammatory loop. And, uh, and so uh, indolamine 2,3-dioxygenase is a really, really important part of, of, this, uh, of this framework. Okay. If there's no there's more no questions. More question. Uh, induces interferon gamma. It's from, uh, so uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce Professor Laura Calza. Okay, so she can uh, continue to address the previous question. I just want to add that as far as I know, but maybe Simona will be able to say more later, during her PhD course, she has plans to also add uh, vessel somehow in her model so but you can give detail later so Lara Calza is a professor at the University of Bologna uh, at the fabric um, department but she's also the scientific director of Fondazione IRET a research institute dedicated to the study of uh, degenerative diseases uh, of the central nervous system she is also the uh, director of the research activity at Monte Catone Rehabilitation Institute, which is a highly specialized hospital, regional hospital, uh, for um, uh, lesion uh, that have to do with the um, central nervous system, nervous system. A founding member of the Transmet Research uh, spin-off from the University of Bologna and the vice president of the Association Cluster, which is uh, the uh, industrial uh, biomedical cluster of the uh, Emilia Romagna uh, region. 
So uh, please, Laura. Uh, Thank go you. On. Thank you, Christine. Thank you very much for putting together this extremely interesting initiative. I strongly believe that we need a strong collaboration between scientists. Uh, to provide uh, um, uh, evidence in supporting uh, the uh, clinical translation of these uh, of these uh, devices so uh, we approach this, uh, this uh, field some years ago exactly with this uh, goal to try to offer uh, basic science uh, results uh, to the uh, clinical application of this uh, uh, potentially extremely important uh, therapeutic uh, uh, solution and devices. So we started, we have done some work uh, in electromagnetic, different kind of electromagnetic field. We also are working on radio frequency, but what I would like to uh, share with you uh, today is our experience using uh, very low level laser therapy and uh, photobiostimulation. And according to the workshop topic, uh, uh, I will focus on the anti-inflammatory action. Uh, most of my data will be in vitro system, but I, would, I will also offer you a perspective uh, uh, moving the, toward the in vivo, in vivo study. So let's start from the general framework. Uh, we uh, are dealing with the extremely low level of energy. Basically, we are dealing with uh, photobiostimulation delivered either by uh, laser devices or by diode uh, devices. Uh, according to this, we focused on the most famous uh, photoacceptor for the red light and the organelle. Uh, that we uh, investigated more in this uh, study is uh, mitochondria. As you know, mitochondria are photoacceptors for the uh, uh, red light that is absorbed by mitochondria, several chromogen starting for cytochromes uh, are absorbed in, my, in the mitochondria. Then the uh, membrane potential of the mitochondria can change. You know very well the dynamic of uh, mitochondrial net inside the cells and plenty of molecular pathways that are activated during inflammation related to this, including uh, uh, formation of uh, uh, ROS formation and, uh, uh, and uh, um, cyclic AMP. Uh, changes in ion uh, by distribution among uh, the different cellular compartments, uh, thus impacting uh, on uh, gene transcription, and this uh, leads uh, to multiple uh, uh, effects. As you know, the mitochondria has a major role also in driving inflammation, and the uh, starting event uh, is the change uh, of the outer mitochondrial membrane potential that activate the downstream molecular pathways uh, uh, involved in this uh, primary role of mitochondria in inflammation. I like to, to share with you the experimental condition that we used because as already emerged from this discussion, we have to be extremely precise and extremely carefully, careful in describing the experimental setup. You see, for example, the very low laser that we use. Here you see the, the, um, uh, the um, uh, wavelength uh, emission, the general uh, power of, uh, of energy emission. We have no thermal effect with this uh, device. Uh, the mood of delivery, pulsed versus continuous. 
and the characteristics of the uh, uh, lead emission, the diode emission. You see, we have different uh, uh, wavelengths, uh, but uh, most of the results uh, will be focused on uh, 645. We use uh, multiple uh, uh, cell system. All of these uh, uh, that I'm showing today are conventional, b-dimensional uh, uh, cell culture system. What we are changing in this experimental setup uh, is the type of uh, glass or plastic coating that uh, is different uh, considering the different uh, interaction between the different cell types and the extracellular matrix. And this can make the difference, of course. We investigate a fibroblast and endothelial cells are as uh, main players uh, of the wound healing and uh, wound uh, and skin exposure to this, uh, to this uh, light, also in therapeutical uh, uh, perspective, but also uh, looked a little bit on neural cells, uh, including cell lines as uh, PC12, but also primary neurons. This is another important point co to consider in the experimental setup. As we say, uh, as I say, our main target is the mitochondria, but considering the point of the extracellular matrix. So now I show you some published and unpublished results. I try to go uh, uh, fast enough to keep in the time. This is, uh, for example, the device for uh, la low level laser exposure. In this case, you see results of neural cell, which has been already published. This is the well in which we have the cover slip that is coated with laminin plus collagen 4. And on top of this, uh, we put the cells. You see he, here the uh, physical parameter of the exposure and the type of measure that we can do. The first one is the cell system maturation that for neural cells is well described by new right elongation. And we observe that uh, red laser light irradiation stimulate new right outgrowth. Then we moved, uh, of course, uh, in the mitochondria. And uh, we label in vivo mitochondria using one of the many uh, mitochondrial dye that change the, the uh, emission white length according to the uh, polarization state of the mitochondrial membrane. And what we saw in this kind of experiment in which we usually apply a very short a pulse stimulation of course, this pass stimulation is then compared to longer stimulation. But usually the main message from this experiment is that a pulse short stimulation is more than enough to change the membrane potential of mitochondria. When we do this, we protect the cells from oxidative stress. You see here, the uh, uh, viability test that we use uh, as higher is uh, the, the, um, the value as uh, val um, um, uh, more healthy are the cells. You see the application of a very classical uh, um, noxious stimulus, uh, the uh, dramatic decline, and you see that uh, laser exposure partially protect our, our cells. Um, looking more deeply on the mitochondrial dynamic, I show you just uh, one uh, result from this uh, other study that we performed. In this case, we use a different uh, coating of our cells that is formed from, uh, from laminin, collagen, for intacting heparin sulfate proteoglycan. And in this case, we use uh, uh, primary fibroblast, not cell line, but primary uh, fibroblast. And we uh, analyze in this case the mitochondrial fu fusion and fission uh, phenomenon that, as you know, 
is uh, 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 um, uh, related to the to the mitochondria uh, healthy state and what we saw uh, is that uh, this uh, uh, um, the exposure to laser light very low levels laser light mod impulsed mod modify the uh, um, uh, the mitochondrial dynamics we in the same experimental condition we also analyzed downstream possible downstream effect of this uh, light cell interaction investigating the expression level of uh, genes encoding for uh, extracellular matrix protein and as you see here we saw an effect on some of these uh, of these uh, 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 genes so it seemed that in this experimental condition some genes uh, encoding for the extracellular matrix uh, are affected by light exposure other not now I show you some unpublished results that we obtain using diode emission mode. In this case, we use a human fibroblast cell line. You see here the device, and uh, uh, here you see the um, control that we performed on the uh, uh, exposure of the of the well. In other words. Uh, we measure the area of the cells directly irradiated by the light and the surrounding area which is not directly irradiated by the light. Again, we exposed to a very short pulse and then we perform the analysis of mitochondria using another uh, mitochondrial dye that, that evaluates the membrane potential. What I like to stress is we perform all the following experiments using a very robust analytical system that is a, a high content uh, uh, cell based high content screening. This allows to analyze in the same experimental set uh, thousands of, of cells, all cells that you have in your uh, system. You see that we observe a scattering effect that we cannot explain at the moment uh, from the uh, center toward the age, but all cells uh, uh, react in the same way. We compare in first uh, the, the, the delivery by lead, by lead, by diode, and by laser, and are of course at, at, at this at, at comparable white length and are comparable. When then we moved, trying to uh, explore the a little bit uh, the spectrum, and this experiment has been done using fibroblasts but also endothelial cells. So I go back to the uh, previous question. And we uh, had here uh, a curious result that I cannot explain at the moment. If somebody has some good idea, I will be happy to hear. You see here in fibroblast that uh, the mean intensity expressing the reaction of mitochondria to light exposure, there is a, a sort of hole at this weight length in fibroblast and not in uvex cells that are the classical endothelial cells that are mainly used for this kind of experiment. So we then moved to investigate 645 wavelengths in the following experiment. And for example, the first uh, uh, think uh, that uh, we observed is the follow-up of this uh, exposure that you see here. And we analyze cells uh, uh, one to three days after the 22nd exposure. And you see that we observe a, an increase at the two times until uh, 48 hours. And that is something saturable not more effect uh, is uh, observed. 
we analyze again the mitochondrial dynamics, fusion and fission, using in this case both mitotracker and mitofusin, that is a protein involved in this, in this effect. And again, we observed an effect, an increase in mitochondrial fusion at a specific white length, not at other. We are always very close to the red, of course. Uh, finally, we went to look uh, the uh, reaction uh, 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 to um, redox stimuli that is uh, 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 delivered in a chemical uh, fashion. And we compare the mitotracker intensity with the, the ROS production and uh, uh, apoptotic cell dead explored by measuring the percentage of condensed uh, nuclein. All this experiment has been performed, as I said before, by cell based eye content screening. Again, we confirm the increase. Uh, of mitotracker intensity compared to the vehicle when we expose to uh, red to uh, oxidative stress we saw a dramatic increase in ROS production in cells exposed to a sham uh, condition and a protection that is, is obtained exposing the uh, uh, cells to uh, uh, 645 uh, uh, white length diode at different uh, hertz uh, uh, um, frequency. Uh, just uh, uh, a flash moving in translational perspective. We always try when we have enough uh, uh, in vitro and robust in vitro data, we try to move directly in animal model of diseases. Here you see a paper that we published several years ago in moving very low level laser in pain models. Three of these models are inflammation based. In some we observe an effect in other not, I can just say to, to try to explain this, uh, that uh, in the model in which uh, we don't see a positive effect, uh, we observed a very severe anatomical alteration of, uh, of the tissues. Take home message, we have to work, I think, uh, very hard uh, to have uh, control exposure system we have to try to have more than one uh, cells in our system. We, have, we need really very robust readouts. And we have to keep in mind, but I saw that we have a specific talk on this, the point of the extracellular matrix also in preparing our cell system. And I thank you for the attention, ready to take ready to take questions. Thank you. Christine, we don't hear you. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you for all this uh, data, also this unpublished data. There are some questions for you. So from uh, Jean-François Moreau, uh, which parameters do you measure in the extracellular matrix? Well, uh, according to the experiment, uh, you, the, the, the basic experiment for us is to analyze uh, around the expression level of around 80 genes encoding for the main protein of the extracellular matrix. So we start uh, uh, simply looking if something changed. I don't. I know very well that is not a mechanistic view, but it's just to focus on a possible target. Then we move uh, to uh, uh, the protein level. If we are in vivo, we perform immunohistochemical experiment to try to have some insight, uh, keeping the morphology of the system. This is what we usually do. Okay. 
Uh, you have another question with, from uh, Professor Vitaly Zablotsky. What is the physical mechanism responsible for the membrane potential changing under light irradiation? It's a, a great question, of course. Uh, we know that cytochrome C is a photoacceptor. Does uh, changing photo, uh, cytochrome C activity the ion distribution between the inner and outer uh, uh, membranes of the mitochondria can be affected. So we suspect that, that this is the way, but of course we have to try to measure directly, analyzing uh, ion channels uh, uh, in, the, in the membrane surface. And then there is an idea for uh, what you asked. So for the scattering you are seeing in your data, uh, Jean-François Moreau says that scattering might mean changes in biophysical uh, extracellular matrix characteristics and or production of hepatocyte growth factor, also called scattering factor. I am very grateful for this uh, biophysical extracellular matrix characteristics because we spend a lot of time uh, 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 putting ourselves uh, in dif on different coating. And the idea in this uh, is uh, to change uh, uh, the extracellular matrix. I know that there is an extensive, extensive there is a, a literature that uh, analyze the uh, large uh, molecule, also um, proteoglycans, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, chains uh, uh, and the frequency of these uh, chains and there are some authors that try to overlap these uh, 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 physical characteristics of this large molecule composing the extracellular matrix with the frequency of, uh, of uh, physical energy but uh, I, am, I am not expert enough uh, to further comment on this. Thank you very much, Laura. So it's uh, my pleasure now to move to the next speaker, Professor Vitaly Zablotsky. He is professor at the Institute of Physics in the, at the Czech Academy of Science in Prague. And he's also part of the International Magnetobiology Frontier Research Center, which uh, is on Science Island and it's a um, laboratory of the Chinese Academy of Science and the EFA Institute of Physical Sciences. His research interest is on the effect of magnetic fields on living cells, and it's a pleasure now to listen to his work. Thank you very much for presenting me. So I will talk about biomagnetic effect. So uh, let me start with a small characterization of magnetic field. It is a permanent magnet, a magnetic field line. So any working electronic device produce IC magnetic field with value about 10 millitesla. Uh, typical uh, needing ferrum pore magnet uh, about one tesla at the surface. Uh, big value of magnetic field uh, used in MRI, MRI scanner up, up to nine tesla and modern device allowed to use 21 tesla. And this is huge magnet world record in Hefei, China. This is me close to this magnet, uh, this magnet generates ma permanent magnetic field, static magnetic field, up to 42 Tesla. I will briefly uh, report about effect of such field. So uh, all biological effect of magnetic field uh, begins in cells. If you look inside in cells, it is uh, definitely electrical unit. First of all, electrical unit and mechanical unit. There are many electrical charges, negative, positive. There are many forces uh, which will you about peak and newton in, inside cells and nano newton outside cells. And the question is how to drive cell machinery. The first, of course, uh, mechanical forces. We can apply mechanical force, vibration, sound, pressure, etc. Uh, of course, we can apply electrical force and change moving ion inside cells and electrical charge, electromagnetic field and light. And we today are focused on using magnetic field. This benefits, certain benefits of magnetic field that it penetrates deep without attenuation in the tissue and cells. So uh, the more main point how to affect cells is membrane potential of cells. You know the cells has membrane potential. So it is a difference between electrical potential inside and outside cell. 
and a value of this membrane potentials given by the famous nerve equation of this part. But we uh, imagine, let us imagine that we have ma magic scroll which can uh, regulate or control change membrane potential of cells. So we calculated in contribution of gradient magnetic field to the membrane potential. And I would like to attract your attention to importance of membrane potential. You see on this scale, a different type of uh, cells has quite different membrane potential. So tumor cells have paradoxically small membrane potential, about 10, 20 millivolt. Embryonic uh, fertilized egg cells also have a very small value of membrane potential. In contrast, cells uh, like skeletal muscles, GIA, neuron has very large value of membrane potential. So if we somehow can change membrane potential, we can treat many, many diseases. Uh, in, even we can, uh, for example, transfer cell, uh, stem cells in, from one state to another state. So we need to control membrane, cell membrane potential with magnetic field. Uh, uh, what is once again what why it is important you see in this slide uh, this is from mike levin uh, paper so if one can change membrane potential on the surface of blastula one can uh, create even organism for with uh, additional eyes or additional tails it is not fantastic uh, fantastic is here so uh, uh, idea is if we will change electric mem membrane potential uh, over the blastula, we can even generate a fantastic animal, the frog with a uh, frog head or frog tail. Of course, of course, it is well, now it is fantasy, but it is not so far. Once again, about uh, distribution of cells over the membrane potential. On the vertical scale, you see value membrane potential in millivolt negative. And here, uh, different type of cells. Cancer cells have low membrane potential. Namely, this fact allows them be, to be very plastic and invasive. Proliferative and stem cells also have very low value of membrane potential. And adult stem cells, not high, but up to 30 millivolt. And another type of cells, in neuron, glia, and especially skeletal muscle cells, have very large value of membrane potential. And what we did, we tried to apply gradient magnetic field, in our case, to the skeletal muscle cells. Uh, just I uh, will change it is this one. So namely C2, C12, skeletal muscle cells. And we applied such like uh, magnetic field. So it has spatial gradient and time very gradient. So it's magnetic field very in time and it, in the coordinate so like that. So it was generated some array of coil, electric coils. So this is spectrum of magnetic field. If we applied this magnetic field to myoblast and myotube, and we calculated and detected that this application changed a little membrane, membrane potential, up to 10%. But it is enough to see very remarkable effect. The first, we detected the change of cytopathoric calcium level. In this experiment, you see if we apply pulse of uh, magnetic field, by the way, the field not so big, uh, 10 up to 100 millitesla. Uh, the uh, uh, calcium release from uh, the depot and the level cytosolic calcium increased. If we switch on, switch off magnetic field decrease, switch on, increase, switch off, decrease again, etc. And in this plot diagram, you can see comparison. The effect is very nice, well pronounced after 50% increase level of calcium and uh, of course it, this effect depends on frequency we use low frequency from zero up to 10 hertz and if we increase frequency of magnetic pulses effect also increase uh, it is very this uh, result have very important application potential in this way we can improve uh, function of skeletal muscle in myophasy we can uh, change uh, calcium signaling, cell signaling. We can affect pain relief, and uh, finally, we can reach any anti-inflammatory anti effect. So the next slide um, show our experiment with stem cells. 
we also use a gradient magnetic field. You see magnetic field was generated by a plate. So this is a rate of permanent magnet. Uh, above this uh, matrix of magnet, we put a dish, cell dish with stem cells, mesenchymal stem cells. This is top view. Uh, I would like to underline that once again, we use non non-uniform magnetic field or gradient magnetic field. It means that value and direction of magnetic field drastically change with uh, the distance, with distance with coordinate. So for example, here, field distribution around one this is small magnet. This is millimeter size magnet. And we use four frequency, four gears. Let's see what happened with uh, stem cells under application of such magnetic field. First of all, I would say that we use three group, control group. So it means that stem cells uh, without any mechanical action, mechanical vibration, and, uh, and without magnetic field, so control group here. As the second, we vibrate, uh, use that vibration, mechanical vibration of this platform, but without magnetic field. So we call it pure mechanical vibration. And group number three is uh, here, we applied oscillating high gradient magnetic field. So we use only magnetic vibration without mechanical vibration. So result are here. This is control. This is one cell, uh, cytoskeleton of cells, so fil affecting filament. You see, after uh, application of mechanical vibration, the cells squeeze it and uh, affecting uh, filament are stressed. The red means that stress is high. Uh, the similar result was obtained for application of high gradient magnetic field. Also, once again, cell is squeezed and uh, affecting filament are stressed, right? Many red uh, uh, filament. So in this plot, you see that effect really significant. This is control. This is mechanical vibration. This is oscillating or magnetic vibration. But what is most interesting is that if we, uh, I forgot to tell that <laughs> it is not immediate effect, we apply magnetic field up to seven days. Seven days after that, analyze the result of this plot, update this plot. What is the most interesting? Most interesting is that uh, application of magnetic field change uh, uh, the direction of uh, stem cell differentiation. So. This type of cells, then under the normal condition, can differentiate into fat or bone cells with approximately 50-50 probability. But if we apply a magnetic field, the probability drastically change. I will show. Uh, so uh, uh, this channel uh, will be closed. So application of magnetic field closes channel of differentiation and stem cells uh, differentiate, differentiate into the bone. We calculate uh, forces from magnetic uh, vibration. It is small, but it is comparable with internal uh, intracellular forces. And we uh, find that uh, magnetic vibration down regulate adipogenic genes. For example, this one, this one, and this one. In this down regulation is huge. It is logarithmic, logarithmic scale, so it is uh, uh, tens times uh, this adipogenic genes suppressed. It means that it confirms that uh, application of magnetic field can close this channel for differentiation and open uh, for differ differentiation into the bone. So, means, uh, stem cells magnetic field increase stem cells osteogenesis. It is important for application in many, many diseases. Uh, the next uh, uh, in fact that we found that application of magnetic field uh, caused some changes of DNA. But I, I will speak about DNA in this slide. It is uh, not, not secret that our life is chiral. So chirality is main uh, feature of life. In this picture you see selection hierarchy for life. So my, practically all, or oh, not practically, all uh, simple alanine molecule, um, simplest organic molecule are chiral. DNA also run right-handed helix 
asymmetrical division of cells is, is this fact, asymmetrical snake uh, rot uh, rotation, asymmetrical body, asymmetrical brain, and asymmetrical magnetic field. This is felt no rule from the school left hand rule in the physics for direction of magnetic force. So uh, let us see what happened if we apply magnetic field to DNA. DNA, you know, uh, rotates during the replication, part of DNA rotate with high frequency. Uh, DNA carry negative charge in the periphery somewhere here. So if it rotate in one uh, in magnetic field, magnetic Lorentz force act on DNA and change uh, DNA structure. So it can rotate faster or slowly if it depends on uh, direction of magnetic field. So we calculated and we decided a uh, simple explanation here. If you take phone cable and start to rotate one direction, you will produce supercoils. If you will rotate in opposite direction, uh, the density of supercoils will decrease and they disappear. So we explore this idea and applied this idea to four type of cancer cells. In this plot, you see that really, if you apply upward magnetic field or downward magnetic field, the effect quite different. So we can regulate DNA synthesis, rate of DNA synthesis. Here, effect is pronounced significant. Here, not, but for here, this type of lung cancer cells, effect again pronounced, and for PC9, also pronounced. So, uh, applying uh, magnetic field, permanent static magnetic field, about one Tesla, we can somehow affect the rate of DNA synthesis in cancer cells. It is also important for application. Uh, and I will finish up with very interesting, fresh result, just publish it. Uh, we use this huge world record magnet, but we uh, uh, did experiment with mice in magnetic field up to 33 Tesla. It is huge magnetic field. Uh, what is interesting? So uh, before experiment, mice were introduced into the, into the depression state. But after living one hour in magnetic field 33 Tesla, they will be happy. Uh, so we did many tests. Uh, uh, references here, but the main result is that uh, oxytocin level low hormone in significantly increase it after exposure of this mice to the high ultra high magnetic field. This is very interesting and we explain um, this this magnetic pressure. It is a known fact that oxytocin is generated in neuron and under osmotic pressure. In our case, huge magnetic fields uh, play a role of osmotic pressure. It is added to osmotic pressure and it generates additional oxytocin. So it is 160% in my brain. It is very big result. So I will finish up with some conclusions. So magnetic field modulates cell membrane potential. Magnetic field improves function of skeletal muscle. It is useful for myophasy, effect in relief. Magnetic field increases cell osteogenesis. In ultra high magnetic field has antidepressive depressive effect on mice. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. It's really interesting to see this variety of results with magnetic field. It's not common to find this type of information. So thank you and for, for presenting all these data. I have a couple of questions. Well, one is just an observation. You discussed also of uh, this experiment where you added mechanical vibration mm -hmm. to the um, magnetic field. So yeah. at, at the end of the afternoon session, there will be another speaker, uh, Timothy Ko, who's working with mechanical vibration, but is in Chicago. So currently it's deep night for him. So he will join us in the afternoon session. Okay. And, uh, I have a question. How do you choose the seven days time after the um, uh, after the magnetic field for the stem cells? Why did you choose seven days? Was it because uh, stem cells uh, typical time of stem cells differentiation? I mean, Byzantine cells fourteen days. So we choose half of this period. So after fourteen days, they do they decide what they will do. So. We choose the half. 
Okay, thank you. There's also another question from Carla Ferreri. Since magnetic field is used for patients, the nutritional status of your model will be very important and also lipidomics. So another uh, point of observation. Yes, uh, we think about, but we didn't experiment on this problem, but we keep in mind. <laughs> yeah, now you have an easy connection to do yeah. so. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for your presentation. It's now time to present Simona Salati. She comes from the uh, IGEA company. Uh, she's the research coordinator. This is a biomedical company and a world leader in biophysical therapies, which again is not that common. Uh, so it's uh, my pleasure to uh, let her speak about uh, her work and uh, uh, the product and the science behind uh, all this. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Christine, for your introduction. And today um, I will talk about uh, the um, adenosine receptors as the mediators of the anti-inflammatory effect we see uh, when we apply pulse electromagnetic fields. So first of all, what is adenosine? So adenosine is uh, a nucleoside, which is uh, uh, commonly distributed in our body, and it's an important regulator or several function in our body, and it plays important uh, function in regulating the cardiovascular system, the immune response, and also the respiratory, the renal, and the gastrointestinal system. Recently, adenosine has been shown to uh, play a protective role, a role also in uh, the central nervous system and uh, in, uh, um, in protecting joint cartilage. And so under physiological condition, adenosine concentration are um, low in the extracellular medium, but under uh, stress condition or after uh, acute damage, uh, damage cells release in the extracellular medium uh, the ATP. And then ATP is dephosphorylated to adenosine. Uh, so then under stress uh, condition or damage, we have high concentration of adenosine in the extracellular medium. And adenosine can play both anti- and pro-inflammatory uh, role based on the type of uh, receptor um, that it binds to. So we have four different types of adenosine receptors. And today we will focus on the A2A subtypes of uh, receptor. This receptor is a G-protein coupled receptor. And when it is activated, it leads to an increase in intracellular uh, cyclic IMP level leading then to an inhibition of the NFKB signaling pathway. And this uh, in turn leads to a decrease in the release of pro-inflammatory cytokines and an increase in the release of anti-inflammatory mediators. And uh, mm, the role of adenosine uh, was already uh, demonstrated in 2004 uh, on uh, articular cartilage. So in this work by Cohen, uh, the author used a septic model for arthrosis of the, of the knee in rabbit, and uh, they, tried, uh, they treated the animals with antibiotics, clearly, plus the addition of an agonist of the H2A adenosine receptor. And what they found is uh, that the treatment, the combined treatment with antibiotics and the agonist of H2A adenosine receptor induces an increase in the protoglycan content of the cartilage, where protoglycan is one of the major components of, uh, of the cartilage. And also, uh, they looked at the histology of the synovial tissue of these rabbits, and uh, they found that the treatment with antibiotic plus the agonist for adenosine receptor is able to restore the appearance of the synovial tissue back to the control level. So uh, there is a significant control of the inflammatory infiltrate in this, in this tissue, plus the antibiotic clearly clear out the, uh, the infection itself. And so based on this premise, um, we were aware of uh, a strong anti-inflammatory effect uh, coupled with pulse electromagnetic fields, and we were not actually capable of explaining this effect. So we didn't have a mechanism to explain this effect. So we decided to study the effect of pulse electromagnetic fields on inflammation. And uh, this is the system we use uh, for in vitro experiments. So we have two coils. Uh, you, really, you see here the setup that we, mm, we place inside the cell culture incubator. And so we have two coils uh, that are connected to a, to a pulse generator. And uh, between the coil, we place uh, uh, our cell culture dish. Uh, this is the signal we apply. So we have a magnetic field peak intensity um, equal to 1.5 millitesla. 
and uh, pass duration of 1.3 milliseconds, and the frequency is 75 hertz. And so using this signal in collaboration with the University of Ferrara, we uh, were able to show that the exposure of uh, uh, cells to pulse electromagnetic fields uh, induces a significant upregulation in the number uh, of the A2A receptor, um, adenosine receptor on the cell membrane. So the, the black bars are pentaxposed cells and the white ones are the control cells. And so these results were firstly demonstrated on human neutrophils uh, and then they were confirmed in different types of cells that compose the, the cartilage, uh, the cartilage environment, such as chondrocytes and synoviocytes. And so we have this increase in the number of adenosine receptors in response to pulse electromagnetic fields. And not only we have this effect, but we uh, could actually demonstrate that the effect we see is an effect which is dose dependent. So uh, we have an increase in the receptor density on the cell membrane uh, when we increase the magnetic field peak intensity, uh, reaching a sort of a plateau effect around between uh, 1.5 and 2.5 millitesla of uh, magnetic field intensity. And so um, we actually bridge this uh, term from pharmacology. So when uh, we describe the effect of a drug based on the concentration of a drug, we talk about pharmacodynamics. And so bridging, bridging from a pharmacology, we uh, kind of came up with this uh, new uh, noun, which is physical dynamics, which describes the effect of uh, a physical signal uh, based on the characteristic of the signal itself, uh, the intensity of the signal, the frequency, and also the time of exposure. So when uh, we study, uh, we, uh, we study the effect of physical signal on, hum on uh, human cells, we apply the same principle of ph pharmacological studies. So we start from in vitro study, when we move into in vivo, and then into the clinic. And so I was mentioning uh, that we have an increase, a dose-dependent increase in the uh, receptor density in the cell membrane. Uh, but does this actually translate into an increase of the signal which is mediated by these receptors? And so in human chondrocytes, we were able to show that uh, in presence of uh, the, the ligand itself, so in presence of the adenosine itself, the exposure to pulse electromagnetic fields is able to increase the uh, level of intracellular uh, cyclic IMP, which is the mediator activated after um, uh, the activation of receptors. And this also turns out in a down-regulation of uh, the NFKB signal in part. So there is a down-regulation in the P65 um, activator of the NFKB signal in pathway. And this, uh, in turn, uh, lead to a, a significant reduction in the release uh, of uh, several pro-inflammatory cytokines. So you see here a decrease in the release of IL-6, uh, a decrease in IL-8, and also a significant increase in the release of uh, IL-10, which is an anti-inflammatory cytokine. So we have a strong anti-inflammatory effect, which is mediated by pulse electromagnetic field exposure. And this anti-inflammatory effect also translates into a chondroprotective effect. So uh, by using uh, um, articular cartilage explants, uh, we put this explant from cartilage into a petri dish, and we treat it with uh, explant with IL-1 to mimic the inflammatory environment of uh, uh, arthri uh, osteoarthritis situation. And so what we found is that treating with IL-1, uh, there is a significant decrease uh, in the protoglycan synthesis uh, uh, from this uh, cartilage explant. But when we expose our cells uh, to pulse electromagnetic fields, uh, you see that the exposure was able to restore the synthesis of protoglycan back to the control level. So uh, this tells us that anti-inflammatory effect of pulse electromagnetic field is actually able to counteract the catabolic activity which is induced by uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines. Also, pulse electromagnetic fields have an anabolic effect on its own, uh, because also here, um, these are human cartilage explants taken from patients uh, with osteoarthritis of the knee. And what we found is that the exposure to pulse electromagnetic fields was able to increase the synthesis of protoglycan uh, at the same level as IGF-1 does, which is one of the major growth factors for, uh, for the cartilage. 
And so then we move uh, to in vivo studies uh, and to test the effect of pulse electromagnetic fields on uh, cartilage and osteoarthritis, uh, we use this guinea pig model. And uh, this is a um, spontaneous model that during age uh, develop osteoarthritis, which is quite similar to the osteoarthritis that is developed uh, in the human knee. And so we took this animal of 12 months of age and uh, uh, we keep we mm, simulate with animals so we had a sham uh, treated group which received no stimulation and uh, another group that received pulse electromagnetic field six hours a day for three months and after three months we uh, evaluate the uh, the car the tissue and the cartilage of this of this animal and what we found is that osteoarthritis actually progressed in the untreated animals whereas the cartilage was actually preserved in the animal that had been treated for three months. So we have this effect of uh, protecting from further development of uh, osteoarthritis. And so altogether, our data uh, show that pulse electromagnetic fields are able to decrease the uh, inflammation in the joint environment uh, through a direct action on H2A adenosine receptors, uh, decreasing the release of pro-inflammatory cytokines and increasing the release of anti-inflammatory mediators. And this in turn leads to a, a protective effect towards the cartilage, reducing the catabolic activities of pro-inflammatory cytokines. We uh, then further move uh, to clinical trial, and I will show you here some, just some data that we have. And uh, this uh, is a study performed on patients uh, affected by early stages uh, uh, osteoarthritis. And, um, and so um, you see this uh, patient have been treated for 45 days uh, with pulse electromagnetic fields. And uh, uh, we see a significant reduction of uh, the pain experienced by these patients, uh, both already uh, visible at 12 months, which was actually lasting till 24 months from the simulation. And uh, on top of this, not only we have a significant reduction in pain in this patient, but we also have a significant improvement in the functional uh, score of, uh, of the knee, which is this cost score. And this is the level before treatment. Uh, and you see this is the level that goes up after uh, the treatment itself. Uh, this uh, effect can also be um, applied in patients with uh, uh, osteoarthritis that are treated with uh, uh, cartilage repair surgery. So sometimes the uh, orthopedic surgeon, when there is a patient with osteoarthritis uh, in the early stages, decided to do uh, this surgical procedure, which is called microfractures. So basically the surgeon um, goes um, arthroscopic in the knees and do, uh, does small fracture in the cartilage, to stimulate uh, uh, the endogenous repair of the tissue itself. And uh, so in this patient, uh, we divided a group of patients in two groups, uh, and we have a, a patient uh, uh, treated with the active device and patient treated with a placebo device. Uh, these patients were treated for 60 days uh, after surgery. And then uh, we measure several parameters. And first of all, what we could see is that already uh, 45 days after surgery, there is a significant reduction in the percentage of patients that are um, assuming anti-inflammatory uh, painkillers, so non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs. So 26% in the active group compared to 71, 75 in the placebo group. There is also a significant improvement in the functional score of the knee which is already visible at 45 days and gets significant after 90 days from the surgery. And what is really interesting to note is that we follow up this patient till three years from the surgery. And there is a significant increase in the percentage of patient that goes back to sport activity in the active group compared to the placebo group. So 62 against 12%. Um, this type of uh, treatment can also be applied uh, um, after um, any type of knee surgery. So, for example, in patients that went through an anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction, uh, again, we have this randomized control trial where we had patient treated with an active device and patient treated with a placebo sham device. And what we found in this uh, patient was that, again, at 60 days from the surgery, we were able to show a significant reduction in the percentage of patients that are uh, taking uh, painkillers, so 8% against 27%. 
We also have a significant increase in the overall quality of life, which is measured by this uh, SF36 uh, questionnaire, uh, which is already visible at 60 days and still uh, lasts at six months. And when we follow up this patient two years after the surgery, we saw an in increased percentage of patients uh, that was able to go back to sport activity with full, fully functional uh, recovery in the um, treated group compared to the placebo group. So um, to conclude, I show you that pulse electromagnetic fields are able to exert a strong anti-inflammatory effect through the action on A2A adenosine receptors and also an anabolic activity uh, directly on chondrocytes and uh, matrix extracellular component synthesis. Uh, we were able to show that pulse electromagnetic fields is able uh, to prevent cartilage degeneration, both in the early stages of osteoarthritis and also after arthroscopic intervention at the knee. In general, we know that every type of surgery in the joint uh, causes a strong anti-inflammatory reaction. And if this uh, inflammation is too strong, uh, it might actually uh, geopartize the success of the surgery itself. So the pulse electromagnetic fields is able to uh, control the inflammatory response uh, after a, a surgery. And so it will uh, control the inflammatory environment of the joint. And this will allow not only a, a better functional recovery in the short term, but it will also allow to uh, preserve all the tissue uh, um, of, of the joint and thus allowing a, a better functional recovery in the long run as well. And I will just conclude with, uh, let's say, my take home message. So uh, what we think is absolutely crucial when we uh, speak about physical energy applied for therapeutic purposes is to identify the mechanism of action of your physical stimulus. So once you identify your mechanism of action, then this will open you the way to um, apply this physical stimulus in all the other diseases where that mechanism might actually play a role. And so we are actually, just to give you an idea of what we are doing now, uh, we know that H2A adenosine receptors are involved in the control of the inflammatory reaction that takes place after acute ischemic stroke in, uh, in stroke patients. And so we are now on a phase two clinical trial applying pulse electromagnetic fields on stroke patients to see if by controlling the inflammatory reaction after the stroke, we are able to reduce uh, the lesion size in this, in this patient and then uh, improving the clinical outcome in this, uh, in this patient. And I would like just to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Simona, for all this information. You mentioned also now your future perspective. Later on, Giancarlo Forte is also working on cardiovascular issues with uh, mechanical stimuli. So this will be an integration also of what you are saying. You have some questions. So. Uh, for, from Jean-François Moreau, could you measure the amount of uh, IL receptor agonist? In other words, is it induced in your model? And if yes, to what extent? The IL-1 agonist, uh, uh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, I no, IL receptor agonist, maybe Jean-François? Well, we use uh, IL-1 uh, beta, uh, the cytokine itself, uh, in the medium, uh, just to mimic the inflammatory environment uh, uh, when we do experiment in vitro, when we take, for example, cells from uh, um, uh, humans uh, and from healthy subjects. So to mimic the inflammation, we, we um, add the cytokine in the medium itself. Uh, so Interleukin receptor alpha antagonist. No, we didn't do any antagonist. Uh, no, we didn't use any, any antagonist in our experiments. Okay, maybe I can. Okay. Uh, Jean-François, if, if you want to ask more, I can add you to the stream. We have a couple of minutes. Not sure. Okay, so I'll go to, there's another observation from Carla Ferreri. Adenosine is also a very important building block for biomolecules. Maybe an under-evaluated effect of adenosine is also that it is the component of coenzyme A needed to activate fatty acids in their metabolism towards phospholipids. This could also explain a remodeling that decreases PGA2 derived from arachidonic acids after membrane lipidomic analysis. This will inspire also an intracetical strategy to help the treatment and patients. Uh, well, yes, <laughs> actually, uh, I'm in agreement with that. Yes, we didn't uh, really go um, uh, so far in uh, in our analysis. So we 
we saw this effect on the adenosine receptors and, and so we we followed on that to to study the anti-inflammatory effect but clearly um it, we are just most probably focusing on a narrow uh, effect uh, of our pulse electromagnetic fields clearly uh, might act on other on other levels I'm adding Jean Moreau to the stream so that he can ask you the question because it's too long to write, too complicate. Also, if you want to speak, I don't know if you are. Yes, yes, uh, thank you very much. No, it's uh, this molecule is um, is uh, is made by the cell naturally, and it goes to the receptor, the IL the IL one beta receptor, and blocks it without inducing the uh, the pathway of stimulation of the receptor so it's a very i can't see you. i can't hear anything yeah we lost your voice oh. jean francois we can't hear you anymore okay maybe we can try later in the discussion so we will end now this morning session Thank you to all the speakers, also to everyone who listened to us. And uh, we are now moving to a sort of private discussion. So for the speakers, please stay here one moment and we are moving uh, to another room.